things. Um, before the beginning of the debate, I'd also like to take a moment to thank Superintendent, John, Superintendent Jonathan Ludwig, Principals Don Moore, Randy Taylor, and Ryan Willis, the East Liverpool School Board, our teachers and staff for supporting today's event, and a special thanks to Mr. Jason Croxell and the PNN crew for running the light, sound, and of course recording today's debate. We are lucky to be joined by all three mayoral candidates. In alphabetical order, Mr. Greg Bricker, Mr. Brian Kerr, and Mr. Ryan Stoke. Thank you all for coming today. The debate format will be as follows. Each candidate will be given a two minute opening statement. Following these statements, a student moderator will ask a question. Each candidate will be given one minute to respond with a 10 second grace to finish the sentence. Uh, speaking order will allow all to approx have approximately equal opportunities of speaking first, second, and last. As determined by a random selection, the first speaker will be Mr. Stowell. Mr. Stowell, your opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, just want to speak a little bit about myself, if you don't know me. Uh, Ryan Stovall, this is my first term as mayor. I am the incumbent uh, from East Liverpool, born and raised in Klondike, in East End. Now I live over on Orchard Road. have three kids, all of them from East Liverpool school system. Hayden's here somewhere. Uh, Shay Lynn graduated last year, and then Emily graduated a couple years ago and is now married and lives in uh, Dublin. <coughs> My wife is uh, Melissa Stovall, uh, Melissa Potts. She also graduated in 1992 from East Liverpool. Um, you know, basically, uh, also want to just say that although we might have differences in political ideas, all three of us definitely want East Liverpool to do better and move ahead. So. You know, just keep that in mind. Uh, we can have political differences, but I'm sure all three of our hearts are in the same spot. Thank you. Mr. Berger. Well, first, I just want to say thank you to the high school for putting this on, and it's crucially important for the kids to be here to see how our, our city works. Uh, and the reason I'm here is it, simply because I don't, I, right now I think our city has no plans, no goals, no vision. Um, you know, if, if we look at our city as a whole, our, our, we desperately need businesses in our town, whether it's downtown or all parts of our city. Uh, how are we, what are we doing as a city to bring businesses in? Our housing is falling apart. I, I've talked to several people the past couple of months and spent a lot of time with our county land bank and we have torn down We'll talk more in depth, I'm sure, later on, but we have torn down close to 140 houses by year end. So I want to put programs and policies in place that prevents that from happening. Now, I don't want to be misunderstood. We have plenty of more houses to tear down, but that is detrimental to a city of our size. We're depleting our housing stock, we're depleting our tax base, our tax revenue, and we have to do a better job of prevent that from happening. Uh, and obviously, our, our infrastructure is absolutely crumbling. Uh, just yesterday morning, I met with our, our state representative, Tim Ginter, and it's the same story, that, is that we are not calling our state reps. I've heard that from Michael Rooley, and I've heard that from Tim Ginter, we are not calling them. I've heard that straight from their mouth, that we are simply not picking up the phone and calling them. There are towns all around Columbia County that are getting the money, and they have lists of examples that are getting money for sewers and water, and, you know, it, they know the problems of our area, but we're not calling them and we're not asking for the money. And lastly, it, you know, it's a simple question is, I want to hear from the community, I want to hear from the students. You know, I want them to move back to the area. Uh, I'm sure if we go around and ask, they're probably, they probably have one foot out the door. You know, if, if we look at the outflow of people over the past years, you know, what are we doing to keep these kids? Uh, why don't they come back? There's no jobs. Well, how do we get jobs to our area? Uh, and you know, this is a vicious cycle. How do we start? Where do we start? And I wholeheartedly believe in the plan it, that I have. And it, it, it's, you know, it starts here, it starts today. So thank you again. Sorry for going over. Thanks. Well, thank you again. Uh, appreciate uh, hosting this event. 
My name is Brian Kerr. Some of you guys know me as the uh, computer guy here. I also own PC Doctors. I'm uh, married to my beautiful wife, Monica. My son, Jaden's here. He's a sophomore. I also have an eighth grader also attending um, East Liverpool City Schools. I decided to run for mayor because, um, much like these candidates have said or are going to say tonight, uh, there, there needs to be a change. Our infrastructure is crumbling, our houses are deplorable, um, and nothing seems to be getting done. I sit on council, we pass legislation, it passes on to the administration, and it stays there. That's what I want to change. Uh, appearance of the city. You can't attract businesses in. Mr. Bricker is talking about bringing businesses in and this and that. You can't bring a business into the city unless you clean the city up. Um, if you remember back, uh, Mr. Uh, the Starbucks came into the pottery, uh, Pioneer Pottery, to do some mugs, and he was interviewed, and he said that East Liverpool looked like a third world country. So with that type of mentality, it's going to be tough to attract businesses in here. That's what we have to change. We have to change the way that people look at East Liverpool. If you look at Columbiana, best places, what's there? Small town, we have that here. We have the appearance. We have the workforce, we have the students, we have the jobs. I see jobs there. We have the cracker plant, we have the Wells Electric plant. Why can't we meet in the middle? We're right in here. Um, so my goal is to bring the, bring the cleanliness, clean up East Liverpool, uh, and try to bring jobs here. And by doing that, by cleaning things up. Thank you. So, you know, being mayor, be, the, the mayor's the face of the city, and the tone starts at the top. And right now, you know, there's a lot of things that are wrong with the city, and I think it's a lack of leadership. It, again, you know, we're not reaching out to the appropriate uh, people, whether it's at a county, state, or federal level. We're not asking the question. We're not engaging uh, the community. And that, I think I can wholeheartedly bring that uh, to that seat. And I would 100% disagree with the councilman. You know, I went head first in downtown East Liverpool where my family's been here 89 years. We've seen better days, but, it, and that's the opportunity that I can show other businesses. I've been there two years now on my own, uh, starting an investment firm. People thought I was, I was crazy and that I'd fail and fail miserably. There is opportunity here. I don't care if there are weeds or what our image is. Our image has been better. I agree 100%. We can turn that around by being, doing simple things. And that's what the mayor does. The mayor sets the tone and he is the face of the city. Thank you for the question. why I would like to be mayor and would be a good mayor is that first of all I'd be a full-time mayor. Um, that's what it's going to take. You need to attend, or I need to attend, or the mayor needs to attend community events. You need to be part of the community more. You need to listen to the public. If you're not out there enough, you're not going to hear the public. Um, and there is opportunity here, and Mr. Bricker is right, the mayor is the face of the city, um, and I hope that uh, whoever is elected does become a full-time mayor, not a part-time mayor. So, thank you. Well, uh, you know, I would disagree with uh, not being... Um, one thing that... Uh, I've ran on, and I ran on the first time, and I run on this time also, is family. When I miss things as mayor, it is because of family, and that's where everything has to start. We have to teach kids, such as yourselves, responsibility. We have to love you and be there for you. You know, being mayor is great, but you also have to be a father, and you have to attend those events I know I get criticized for that, but that's a way of life. Um, you know, can I do better? Probably yes, but 
I try to be a father first, and that's what I continue, will continue to do. Thank you. dollars to put a dock in um, to access the riverbank there right across from Babs Island. I did all that, put the dock in, put the deck in, and then about uh, two or three weeks after I get everything done, the last nail in, the city comes and says that they're going to revoke the permits because it's city property. So I went to my council uh, person, which was Linda Ziegler um, and Sherry Curtis at the time and said, hey, I did all this work. It's, it's Look at what I'm doing. It's, it's beautiful. It's, it's beautifying the city. It's beautifying the area. Plus, it gives my family a chance to enjoy the riverbank. Um, I was told to take it out. There was no uh, ifs, ands, or buts. And we fought it. We fought it. And it, it's still there today. So that's how I got involved with politics. Thank you. Um, I've been the vocational program, didn't really think about politics too much. I've always been uh, involved in community events and, and helping. Mr. I'm sorry. Uh, actually, in high school, I was part of the vocational program here. Uh, went through the nursing aid state program and did that. Also uh, became an emergency medical technician while still in high school uh, over in Pennsylvania. Never really thought about politics. Graduated, uh, became a police officer for the city of East Liverpool. Was there for seven years until uh, layoffs came. Then I uh, left that job. And uh, that's basically why I thought get involved and ran for city council at that time. I was on city council for seven and a half years and uh, decided to run for mayor. Thank you. That to answer the question, no, there was certainly no point that it struck me that I'd ever run for office, but you know, this has really come full circle. I, I remember you know, when she asked the question, sitting in Mr. Wallen's office learning about the three branches of government and how our government is supposed to work. And that's exactly what has led, uh, led me here is, you know, I, I don't think that, that our community has a voice right now. I, I don't think the business community has a voice uh, as, along with residents. And that's what I want to be is, is be that liaison from the business community to the city uh, you know, the, the residents of the city are not here to serve the government, it's the other way around. And that ties directly into community engagement. Um, you know, I would, again, love to hear from the kids and tenants today. Of, you know, what do you want to see from, from your city? I remember being your age and, you know, there's nothing here. So, you know, every uh, Friday and Saturday night, we would go to Sheets and hang out, and then we'd go to my basement and play Halo, right? Just because there's nothing here to do. So, you know, what, what do you think? <laughs> Population 
of East Liverpool. I think it's Craig's. go to input 17 please and turn that on and bring that up please. What can a mayor do to help increase the population of East Liverpool? Well, uh, if you didn't see the statistic that did come out from the Census Bureau um, for 2018, which they come out every July. So 2018 statistics came out this past July. For the first time in 67 years, the East Liverpool population did increase. It was an increase of 22 people. And a lot of people do not think that that's a lot. But when you have 67 years of decline, 22 reverses that. And while we're headed in the right direction, and that's because of our location, bringing jobs in, and the the value of living in East Liverpool, it does not cost as much to live here. We have the Shell plant up there. We're getting workers that moved here from there uh, because taxes in Pennsylvania are outrageous. You can live in East Liverpool and in Ohio for a lot uh, less money than you can up there. So, you know, we keep working on that. We keep working on our housing infrastructure and keep doing what we're doing. But for 67 years, we were in decline. And this uh, last time, we finally reversed that trend. That is an excellent, excellent question. So how do you get, how do you track young people? How do you track the next generation? We're an aging demographic, so we need to build the next generation of residents in East Liverpool, because we, are, as a country, we are dying off. Those are the statistics I see them every day. Uh, so how do we build that next generation? We have to, first of all, change our image. Because the image right now, as we're nothing but uh, a drug town, we're nothing but a town full of criminals, because we keep taking pictures of people and putting them on Facebook, uh, dehumanizing them, kicking them while they're down, and instead of helping them and giving them a second chance, we blast their picture all over the internet, which is terrible. So we need to not only help those people change our image, uh, we need to get businesses downtown. Aren't you more inclined to live in a city that has more retail or shops uh, that you're able to walk to? Because uh, right now, again, our, I've had people tell me that they're scared to come downtown after dark, which it blows my mind. I walk to and from work all the time, and never have I been scared to walk down through downtown East Liverpool. Correct. We had 22 people uh, come back into the town, so that's a pretty good increase uh, if you want to look at it that way. But we haven't built a house since 2014 in the city. No new house has been built in the city. So we need to change that. And one way to change it is fixing up Riverview property. Get rid of it, develop it. I've been working with a developer right now. I'm also talking with another developer that wants to do some stuff downtown. But they say that the, the environment's toxic. So we need to change that. Also, to attract and have stuff, most of the students now, my boys, uh, I'll go to Tim Hortons. That's where they hang out at. My plan is to change the parking lot on 6th Street and Broadway into a green space, a place that people can go downtown and feel comfortable. Um, by doing that, it's going to bring people downtown and let them feel safe and see it firsthand. So that's my plan. Thank you. What are your plans to help businesses grow in 
So my plan to help, is, first of all, and that goes back to, you know, we need a liaison from the city to businesses. Uh, you know, if you talk to any business in town, they, they don't know who the current administration is. And it's a simple question that we're not asking is, you know, I'm so-and-so from the city. If you ever need anything, please come in. My door is always open. That is not happening right now. Right now, we are anti-business, and I cannot understand why. We're sending letters to businesses that you need to pull weeds, repair roofs. If you don't, we're going to find you. We're not returning phone calls. Uh, I, I mean, I am in the business community every single day talking to our local business leaders, and I hear it firsthand. So it's... It, it, to, it's a very complicated question, but a very simple question is you work with businesses, you listen to them. Uh, I've talked to businesses that are getting flooded out because we're not clearing storm drains. We're not keeping the drains cleared. Their business is floods. So if history has told us anything, has taught us anything, that the businesses that have been downtown can easily move to Calcutta, and our councilman is a perfect example. If, the, if our town does not work with businesses, they will move. And they will continue to move, and our downtown is, is probably at an 80% vacancy rate, and it will get worse. So, um, good point about business being moved. Um, I tried everything I could to be downtown. I never had Mr. Stowe come into my store on the corner. I think he came in one time to have a petition signed. The previous administration never came in to see what I needed. Um, our overhead was, was through the roof with the heating costs and everything else that we had to do. Um, I had an opportunity that a business came to me that wanted to open up in downtown. And we couldn't find him a location downtown because most of the buildings there weren't up to code. Uh, I took the opportunity to say, hey, I'm gonna take my business risk and move. And I put this business in there now, which will be open in this Friday. Uh, it's a coffee shop. It's gonna be a great asset to downtown. It can be a place that you guys, the students, uh, the public can go and hang out at instead of Tim Hortons, support that business. It's all from scratch. His business has put a lot of money into that building because he believes in downtown as much as I do. Um, there's another business open up down the street that uh, I was able to go talk to them. Columbia, um, Mr. Kirk. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, I would disagree with Mr. Bricker about not visiting businesses. One thing I do during my lunchtime is walk downtown because that's what I've done since I was a police officer down there. I was the first community policing officer. I went and walked around town then, visited the businesses as a police officer. I still do that today. Uh, I have been in both of their businesses um, to speak with them. I also stop in, uh, speak to Andy's, if you know where Andy's is down there, talk with him, see what you know they would like to see in the diamond area. We stop, I stop in almost all the businesses downtown. We, I go to lunch down there. There's uh, the new uh, restaurant beside Walnut Lanes. We go down there, have lunch, support our downtown businesses as much as possible. But as far as that goes, I do get out and I walk with them and ask what is needed to be down there. And I think that's what we have to keep doing. You have to be engaged. There's no doubt about that. But East Liverpool won't be the retail center. Not as long as there's Walmarts and things like that there. That will not happen. So we have to cater to the mom and pop shop. And that's what we're working on doing right now. How would you encourage or enable younger voices to be involved in government? <coughs> Um, today is a perfect example of how to get uh, involved. Uh, I see some people with shirts on. I see a, a lot of uh, young faces that seem to be interested in what we're trying to say to you. Uh, your voice does matter. Um, I think things that need to change is that we need to have events downtown for the younger generation. To have events to where we can have food trucks. Close the street off, bring some basketball courts out, basketball hoops out, portable basketball hoops. Let you guys have a night down there just to enjoy yourself, have fun. 
But that's the things that I think once we do, you can get involved more and get a voice to what needs to be heard. So. Well, I would agree with Mr. Kerr. This is definitely a start here today, having events like this where kids are there. I would like to see students get involved with city council. I know that you guys have student council here. There should be a liaison between those two to help, you know, some of the some of the things that's on the books with the laws, the mayor doesn't change those and don't enact them. They're enacted by council. So if you see something that, that needs change because it's antiquated, things like that, it would be great to see that uh, cooperation with there. I work with the Boy Scouts a lot. We've done several projects this year for Eagle Scout projects to get, get them involved. Uh, one of them was a award through a grant that uh, I received called the Boy Scouts. They came down, uh, helped paint the wharf and get it uh, all cleaned up again. We just had a Eagle Scout uh, work with him and our city do the front of City Hall. So if you ever been down there to see that, uh, it looks beautiful. You can actually see the monuments that are down there now that were covered. Also the diamond area, they, they've been down there working. But it has to be uh, cooperation between both parties. So th this ties, I've been you know, saying it for quite some time now, it ties right back to community engagement. Uh, you know, one of the, my ideas is we need some sort of citizen advisory council, and that, that could easily happen at a student advisory council. What if you, know, you got together in your government class and formed a group of you know, like-minded individuals that basically you need a voice. You deserve a voice in this community as much as the residents. Uh, because again, I want you. I want you guys back. I really do. We have to build that next generation of people. You know, I, I, if we go around and ask you, some of you guys probably are, already have one foot out the door. So what do we have to do? If, if you had that voice right now, if you had that representation to our city government, you know, what would you be saying? What what voice are you going? What are you going to be telling us to do? So I mean, that's a great question. That's an easy easy question to solve. attend the same school as them. Uh, you know, we were a lot closer back then. Uh, well, when I was growing up, when you go outside and play, that's what you do with the neighborhood kids. Now it's FaceTime and, uh, and that kind of stuff. So, you know, or online gaming uh, is how they interact. Uh, but that's, that would be mine. There's certainly not one I can pinpoint. High school was a great time and a great group of friends that I'm still, still very, very close to to this day. Um, you know, it's it, a lot of weekends. You can ask my my parents are here. Of 20 guys in my basement playing video games all night. Uh, to you know, uh, we dressed. We all did face painting or the, the body paint for the Potter Beaver football game, and we spelled out, "Let's go, you simple Potters." And there was like 30 exclamation points. Uh, so there's, you know, over 50 of us organized a tailgate at Beaver Local Stadium. I would highly encourage you to do the same. It was a great time. But uh, it's, I mean, it's really a, a long list of memories from, you know, playing soccer and just making lifelong friends that I still keep in touch to, uh, keep in touch with till this day. Um, my memory would be uh, at the OBAC <laughs> tournament for golf. I was trying to get a scholarship to a Division I college. Um, I missed the putt, so I went to Columbus State instead. Um, the 
memories is kind of also with you because working here at the school, I get to see each and every one of you in the hallways. But then also if I go to an athletic event, I get to see you there and then I get to see you in the hallway the next day and feel like, hey, you know, I was part of that. Um, so it's nice to see uh, everybody's faces and be part of the memories that you're creating. So thank you. ScienceDirect.com has proven the economical benefits of tourism for a city and its local businesses. How would you increase the flow of tourism, if possible, to its <clears throat> Yeah, that's an excellent question. So right, right now, we are a drive-by city. There are so many people on a daily basis that drive right through us, but yet uh, we have no reason for them to stop. If you think of the number amount of cars that go through Route 711, uh, Route 30, uh, you know, West Virginia, PA, and even through our town. Uh, again, it, it's our, our image plays a huge part in this. Why are they going to pull into a town where our, ro our roads are a mess, our weeds are you know, growing over the highway? And lastly, we don't even have any signs on our highway to say, hey, you know, the Lou Holtz Hall of Fame, turn right here. Uh, the hot dog shop, turn right here. Bricker's Cafeteria, you've been there since March 12, 1930, turn right here. So it's, I mean, there, there's no sign of it. We have no signage to inform people what is now town. So, you know, I mean, signage is key in redeveloping a town to draw people in. And again, we have to stop people from driving by and drive in. That was a good plug. I have to uh, so I agree with some of the stuff Mr. Berker's saying. I mean, our image has to change. So the one thing that bothers me is that when you get off the exit to downtown, you can't say can't see the signs as Welcome to East Liverpool. We are the pottery capital of the world. Does anybody know that? When they drive past our town, do they know that? If you go in our shops downtown, antique mall, other places, do you know? Do you have little trinkets? You know, little things that say East Liverpool. You know, something that represents our history and what we have to offer here. I don't see that. Uh, the the sign coming in from the PA side in the East End. That sign was broke for three years. Boyce Church donated a sign to make it look better. We are the point of the beginning. Point of the beginning down there in East End. Anybody know that? Um, those are things that when Mr. Brecker says people drive by and they don't see it, he's, he's right. Uh, the weeds are a big issue. That's one of my biggest pet peeves. You know, Every year we can clean those weeds and, and clean them up, but we need to put something down to stop those weeds coming in and make the appearance of the city look 10 times better. Thank you. Well, some of the things that we're, we're doing right now, uh, as, as a member, founding member of ELCPR, if you've heard of that organization, we have started the Rib, rib Fest. Uh, that, that brings people in from all over, this, not just this state, but other states also. The last one uh, that we had brought in around 10,000 people. So through events like that is how we are growing and, and getting people to come into our city and see. There's lots of work to be done. It didn't get that bad over four years and it's not gonna get better over four years. But with groups as, he, as uh, we started with ELCPR, we're able to do that. We're also bringing back next year the River Regatta. That will help out also because the river is one of our best assets to have here. So we're working real hard on that and it's all done through volunteers. So, you know, going back to uh, what we can ask of the uh, Young people, volunteer on these committees so that way we know what you want. Anybody wants to do that, you can get a hold of me and I'll get you with the right people. But these are the events that's going on. something, uh, say something. Just like my motto is, if you see something, fix something. 
Um, I don't agree with the vacationing committee. I think that makes the city look bad because when I think of vacation, I want you to come here to the city and feel like you're on vacation, not feel like, hey, look, if I come to the city, I can get arrested. Um, there's other people that, yeah, I suggest that they do come here and they do get arrested, that they deserve it for what they're bringing into our town. But to make it safe, make sure our police officers have what they have, what they need, and make sure they patrol with the way they should. Our department, our police department right now, um, is a little bit, um, how can I put it, divided. And once they come together, which I, I feel they will very soon, they will come together. It's a great police department. They patrol everything they possibly can. But I don't think they get enough credit for that. A lot of times people see stuff and, and they complain and say, well, they're not doing this, they're not doing that. The traffic cameras are a big issue. They kind of blame the police department for that. That's not their fault. Um, they do what they have to do, and I, I commend them every day for what they do. So, thank you. Well, we would continue to try to deter the crime. What we, by that, what I mean is we have increased since my, I came in office from 15 police officers to 21. Three of those officers, the reason we're able to have them is because of those cameras. Don't speed, you don't get a ticket. It's very simple. So, you know, that's, that's the police officer in me speaking. If you break the law, that's just how it is. You gotta pay the piper. We have to keep on the drug dealers. It takes citizens not just the police department to take back their neighborhoods. And through the See Something, Say Something program, that's what's going on. I can tell you that I'm at home in, in bed at 11 o'clock at night getting messages and we'll send them on to the people on the drug task force because that's, that's how it works. There's, it has to be a whole group effort. We can't rely strictly on the police department and we have to get, keep getting the community members involved and helping us out. Thank you. So as I stated earlier, I, I still think you know this is a safe community to live in, and it's because of our image that we're portraying that we're you know it's nothing but drugs here, it's nothing but criminals, and that's something that can easily be changed. Um, you know we we do have a drug problem, but why do we have a drug problem? You know it's idle hands, we, we need more jobs. What if we bring more jobs and get people to work? They have, then they have something to do. They're not gonna be you know, drinking, doing drugs, etc. So it, it, this is, again, this is a vicious cycle. Round and round we go, and I think it starts with bringing jobs, bringing business to the city. Uh, you know, and, and that's the opportunity. I can show the opportunity to other people where, again, I was told I was going to fail and fail miserably by going to downtown East Liverpool uh, there is opportunity here, and I think that ties directly to our housing, ties directly to our community, ties directly to our drug problem. Well, once again, working with uh, organizations such as the LCPR, we are uh, right now working on a plan to bring in an indoor facility downtown. Uh, if any of you, I know a lot of the younger kids here play soccer and things like that and go to Salem, uh, and that's a problem. There's, we should have something here, downtown, or even in another part if we can't get property downtown for that. But, we're looking to bring in an indoor turf facility to have kids be able to do baseball inside in the winter, soccer inside, you know, you can, different things like that to get going. Um, you know, it takes money and it takes time, but we have the right people involved. Uh, one of the people that we do have involved is an East Liverpool graduate. And believe it or not, he was one of the ones to build the Gund Arena and help with that. So we have the right people, and we're just trying to get everything lined up with that. There, there's been a mass exodus of people over the past decades 
Uh, you know, over the past four years, over 200 people have left our city alone. And, you know, we can, and my biggest question is, when are we going to stop pulling that card that we're playing in the past? You know, I want to focus on now and going forward and how to get the people I graduated with back, the people older than me, the people younger than me, the people in the crowd, how are we going to retain them? You know, a lot of you are going to go on to school, you're going to go on to some sort of post-secondary school or maybe jump right into the workforce, and you're going to go where the jobs are. Again, it, 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 we keep leaning back to the same point of jobs. Jobs, 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 economic development, and again, right now we are at an absolute crucial time from an economic standpoint. You look up the river, you look down the river, you look at Lisbon, you look at Columbiana, you look at Beaver PA as the prime example, even Midland. Midland is building a brand new school, and ask yourself, why is it not happening here? It, it, there are so many things wrong with this city, but it, and, you know, the thing it's gonna take the most is the right leadership. How many of uh, your students right now are in the Kent State program taking extra classes? That's the first step. We have the education here. We also have the trade school, Newcastle School of Trades. We have um, jobs up the river, down the river. We don't have to necessarily say that we have the jobs here right now, but the jobs are around us. So if we educate you, maybe do a program with Newcastle School of Trades to do some type of uh, apprenticeship or something that's going to get you in the workforce but educate you into a trade, that right there would be a win-win because you're still in the city. Um, everybody says we need jobs right here. We need jobs in the city. And that's true. But if you live in the city, you're going to pay income taxes. Um, I don't know how many taxes you guys pay yet, but one day you're going to pay a lot. So the income taxes is important to the city. So if you live here and work somewhere else, we can get some money from you. So that's gonna help the tax base, plus it's gonna get you a job somewhere else, but still keep you here in the city. Thank you. How do you plan on improving the city's infrastructure, especially the roads? What other ways besides taxes are there to increase revenues, and how can you help us as a mayor to access those funds? That is a great question, and I've been sleeping with this. This is over 50 pages. This is our budget. Uh, I think a lot of you would be surprised. We have a gross revenue as a city of 20, over $24 million. My question is, where is all that money going? It, it, expenditure after expenditure and wasteful spending, and that's where we need to stop. And the, the, the resources are in here. We have the funds to pay some roads, but again, we need to do a better job of contacting our state reps, our local reps. There are grants out there to be had. I, again, I met with Tim Ginter yesterday morning. Uh, places like Winona, I didn't even know Winona existed in Columbia County. They got a ton of money to redo their water or sewer system. Hanoverton, little town of Hanoverton, got a million dollars to replace their either water or sewer as well. We are leaving money on the table. We are not asking the question. We desperately need it. We need it the most in Columbia and accounting. We are simply not picking up the phone and asking for it. So the numbers. So the numbers um, that we get from the levy for the road levy is. Four hundred and thirty-nine thousand dollars and forty-nine four hundred thirty-nine thousand five hundred dollars we get a year from the road levy fund. We also generate about three hundred twenty-nine thousand dollars from the stormwater utility. So the question is, why is the infrastructure this bad? It shouldn't be. So my plan is a three-year plan for one point four million dollars to get the money that you guys have that you're paying into to fix the roads. Some of those, uh, some of the equipment we're going to use is a Dura Patcher. I don't know if anybody has seen one of those. ODOT runs it every every day, it seems like, anymore. It's a, it's, it's a emulsion system. You can pave it. You can patch any time of the year as long as it doesn't go below 20 degrees. That's a simple fix that we can patch year-round. Uh, chip and seal. I don't understand why some of the neighborhood roads that don't have a stormwater drop that's going to get gravel in it, why we can't do this to do the uh, chip and seal. So that's my plan. I have a plan that I can start and put in place January 1st. Thank you. I figured
this was going to be one of the questions, because uh, Rhodes is uh, always one of the uh, top complaints, obviously. So I, I wrote some stuff down here. I'm going to try to hurry up and go through it. Just some straight up facts. Currently, the street department has five to seven men on it. This department used to have 35. The city has not shrunk, just the population. The, uh, to date this year, we have spent $478,248 in road repairs, whether it's patching or going out and doing full depth uh, resurfacing. We're currently with working with ODOT. I personally have a meeting with them. I believe it's tomorrow. It's a luncheon to do Route 39 from the bottom of the four-lane highway all the way through East End in the next two or three years. Uh, we did secure a grant to replace the highway lighting project out here. These grants, though, and contacting the people that Mr. Bricker's saying, they require matches. We don't have the matches. Thank you. If tax revenues are cut, how will the city safety forces and the public services be affected? That's probably one of the second best questions besides infrastructure and our roads. Um, Mr. Stobel pointed out that with the traffic cameras, they were able to put three officers on. I would never agree to that. We have no say so as council members to say where that goes. We allocate the money, they decide where to spend it. Um, now, with the traffic cameras going to be on the ballot, and I know a lot of people are going to vote yes to get rid of them, um, those officers have a, a chance to no longer have a job because we relied on the traffic cameras so much. We're dependent on those traffic cameras. Should have never been that way. It should have been helping the infrastructure. It should have been helping to improve the city instead of relying on it so much in one area. If you look at Liverpool Township, they brought a levy to the voters to get a new administrative building. The voters said no. The township decided, hey, look, let's take this traffic camera money and put it towards the building. They got a brand new administrative building zero cost to taxpayers. If the traffic cameras go away, they still have that building. If our traffic cameras go away, we have three officers, less officers on the road. Thank you. What Mr. Kerr fails to tell you is we have money that has not been received, that is in collections from those traffic cameras. There's $3 million that's sitting there and you can't even get it. It's just like any other civil penalty, all right? I don't know if you guys realize it, but there are ways that you collect civil penalties, and you can go over them, through, go after them through the court system and make people pay those. And the city will do that. So if, if it comes down to that, then we will be able to still fund our police officers and without have no reduction in force with that. There's, there's lots of different things that we can do. Hopefully, we're working, uh, we have the uh, medical marijuana facility coming in, it will be up. Income taxes will be also coming up from that. Uh, so, there are ways, and we will not lose police officers or firefighters uh, while I'm still in office. So we, as a city, we have de developed this business model that we're, we're sustaining ourselves on a completely unpredictable model that we have no idea where all this traffic money, uh, camera money is going to stay or go. So right now, the projection, I sat down with the city auditor, our projected revenue is roughly anywhere between you know, $775,000 and $850,000 per year. So what happens if the camera money goes away? Well then, you know, again, if you look at a business, that's layoffs, unfortunately. So again, a completely, completely unstable business model is, and I keep pounding the pavement, it's back to businesses. How do you increase revenue? You bring businesses in, you 
bring employees in. You attract young people to live here. You attract them to move here and build an actual tax base. You don't build it off something so unsustainable such as traffic cameras. It's completely, completely backwards. Continue to work with businesses and bring them in. Here's a little stat for you too. Income tax collections for the city have been on the rise since 2016, which is when I took office. The in 2015, the year before, we realized income tax collections of $2,482,958. Last year we collected $2,627,527. So that's an increase of $144,000 right there. The businesses that have already pledged and been licensed to come in, such as the uh, new uh, the Ferro building, the uh, medical marijuana facility, that's 100 jobs right there, and that will also increase our revenue. They're projected to make right around $100 million. So when you convert that to 1.5%, that's $1.5 million that the city will realize once they are fully operational in income taxes. Thank you. So I, I've already started it. Since deciding to do this, I've been uh, calling businesses and asking them a simple question, what would it take to get you downtown East Liverpool? And they, they, people want to come downtown, but they have no idea where to go. So, you know, as far as prioritizing, it, you know, that's a great question. Uh, there's so many things to do, but it, it's as simple as, you know, creating an inventory of buildings. Again, there, there are businesses that want to come downtown. What if we went through all of downtown, created a, an inventory of every single space that's empty, that's available for rent, got the square footage, what it could be used for, and got the contact information for the person who owns that, and then simply hand that off to the prospective business. When we hand that off, we hand off a checklist to every business that says, you know, if you want to do business in East Liverpool, you need to talk to the fire chief, you need to talk to uh, the planning department. If you're opening up a restaurant, you need to talk to the health department. Right there, you just gave them two lists, and you circumvented so much time and aggravation. Uh, but, that, I mean, that would be number one. I've already begun that process, so just keeping uh, that going, and it, it's a little simple thing, just changing our image. Uh, we're not, a, you know, there are great people that are still here, and stop, you know, portraying us as nothing but criminals and drug addicts. Well, the first thing I would do is, many of you probably figured out, is fire Brian Allen. Um, the second thing I would do is. Look at what we have. I mean, there's. I've already talked to the, the owners of the buildings downtown. I've already talked to them. They're willing to come back, back in here. It's just that we have to change the landscape of what's downtown. You can't expect a business to come there if there's nothing there to attract them. Um, right now, that, that doesn't exist. We need to have a, a food truck event. Bring people down. Uh, Mr. Stovall mentioned the, uh, the Jazz Fest. That brings people in to our town. That gives them an opportunity to see what's available in our downtown. But also, nobody mentioned East End. East End is a gem. It has a lot of land, it has a lot of property. It has property that we own. We are the owners of it. You, the taxpayers, own that property. We bought it with your money. So East Junior could be developed. Riverview property, if we don't develop it in a year or two, get rid of it, period. Tired of holding on to it. We ain't doing nothing, get rid of it. So we're at the end of our questions. Um, I want to give the candidates just one last minute each to, if there's any closing remarks you'd like to make towards the students, uh, we'll start with Mr. Berger to continue in our work. <laughs> I'm going to ask for the closing remarks. Can we please keep the applause 
to none, and then we'll give a big round of applause at the end so we can keep things moving, all right? I know. I'm a math teacher. You know I'm going to do that. <laughs> okay, so it, again, how do you start, where do you start, and it, I'm going to circle back to the business, bring businesses back downtown, and work with the councilman to bring his business back within the city. Uh, and, you know, we have a lot of issues right now, and again, you know, I can't stress how important this decision is. It's not the next four years. It's, it could be potentially our, our future as a city. Uh, if we miss the boat now, you know, we may miss it entirely. Again, it's happening all over the county. It's happening all over our area. It's not happening here. Our infrastructure is crumbling. The housing is just an absolute mess. And I don't want to be misunderstood. We have a lot of, a lot of houses that still need to work down. But we need to work with the county land bank and get those houses through the process to rehab and sell them to potential homeowners. And working with the county land bank, I desperately, desperately want everyone here to call call Tim Ginter, call Mike Rooley's office, and tell them to vote yes on House Bill 252-252. Without that House Bill, our county land bank is going to run dry, and our and East Liverpool will get worse. That means no more money for the land bank, no more money for East Liverpool to rehab these houses to tear them down. Thank you. I'm going to stand here and address you because I think that's where we need to be, face to face. When we're trying to change stuff in the city, we have to work together, and that has to be face to face. We can't work behind a desk. We can't work behind Facebook, even though I'm on Facebook, as everybody probably knows. Um, we need to make sure that we change that. We need to change how the image of East Liverpool is viewed by other people. We can be the Columbiana. We can definitely be it. And minus the circle that everybody messes up every time they try to the roundabout or whatever. We're not going to have that. Um, I, I feel it's important to have green space downtown. I think the parking lot, right, like I said, on 6th Street and Broadway is a perfect example to change downtown, the way it looks. You do that, have food truck events, have events for the younger uh, generation to go down there, close the street off, let them have fun one night. Why not? That's what I'm asking. I'm asking for your vote, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, listen, it comes down to one question, all right? And if you take personalities out of it, and you give me in the, go into that booth and you ask one question, is the city of East Liverpool better now than it was four years ago? And you can honestly say to yourself, yes or no, you will say yes. We have gained money, we've gained population, we've gained businesses. Businesses have moved here from Boardman. Everybody knows Boardman is booming. All right, but we gain businesses from Boardman that's now located in East End, and it's because of where we're located and because they wanted to be here. So I'm also asking for your vote to continue what we're doing, what we're working on, and let's let's make the change. Let's do it. Thank you. Okay, so that concludes our mayoral date. Can we have one last hand for our three candidates? Who are Judge Melissa, wow, I'm going to I'm sorry. I'm going to talk a lot. Judge Melissa Byers Emerling, um, she's going to come up and speak for a little bit about the judicial branches. You guys have learned in government, I'm sure there are three co equal branches of government. We just heard from our mayoral candidates. We have some information on city councils, students, you're going to stay where you're at.